Hello and welcome to the European Resilience Initiative Center video podcast. Today our guest is Yulia Kasdovina. She is visiting fellow at the Stockholm Center for Eastern European Studies and a senior fellow at the Foreign Policy Council Ukrainian Prism. Welcome, Yulia. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you for having me. You have published recently a comprehensive study on uh, challenges which Ukrainian state is facing amid the mobilization. The Ukrainian army needs manpower, obviously, and the mobilization remains a hot potato in the hands of politicians. Uh, well, if you remember uh, the first day after the uh, Russian invasion, there were huge lines of volunteers in front of uh, conscription offices in Ukraine. And uh, that picture was uh, uh, all over the place as a uh, sign of uh, Ukrainians' resilience. But um, a year later, uh, Ukraine started uh, experiencing manpower problems. And if initially uh, officials were not too willing to talk about them, uh, but uh, sometime in mid-2023, uh, the problem uh, became um, openly acknowledged. And uh, so what's, uh, um, there are a number of issues that uh, Ukraine is facing. Uh, one of them is uh, that, um, of, of course, uh, I'll just, uh, as in uh, any war, you have people who want to dodge the draft, right? They don't really want to fight in the war. Uh, also, another issue is uh, the unreformed system of uh, mobilization. Actually, Ukraine knew that it was going to have uh, the problem with uh, the commissariats. And uh, right before the war, uh, there was an attempt to uh, reform them, so to improve record keeping, to make the processes more transparent. But uh, it did not happen. It happened uh, right before the changes were uh, adopted, right before the war started. And so they did not really uh, get implemented properly. And uh, uh, also another problem is uh, uh, that uh, there were several pretty loud cases of uh, corruption uh, in the conscription offices, and one of them, uh, probably the most uh, well-known, was uh, Mr. Borisov, who, who was uh, the regional uh, head of the regional conscription office in Odessa, uh, who bought a very expensive house and, and an office in uh, Spain, in Marbella. And so that became sort of a uh, case that drew attention to what is happening in uh, in the uh, in the system and how, unfortunately, uh, corrupted it is allowing people to dodge the draft. And so uh, another issue, of course, is uh, uh, that uh, people who uh, well volunteered in the first days uh, of uh, the invasion. Uh, the current legislation does not provide uh, the term for for their cult, uh, for which they are called to serve, and so basically, uh, those who are current uh, at the front lines from the first days of the war, uh, they can be discharged only for either health reasons or uh, reaching the age of uh, sixty years, or basically if 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 they are killed, right? So that's. Uh, uh, that's another uh, issue that uh, actually gets in the way. People don't want to go uh, to the army sort of buying one-way ticket, right? And so uh, Ukraine had to address uh, all of these multiple and very different uh, issues that arose in the process of mobilization. But that are the cases which can, like, scare people out. And, of course, during the war, uh, for many people, uh, scare is pretty natural. People don't want to die to get wounded injured they, they they have they are afraid of their families and that is a natural fear which uh, some people overcome thinking about the greater good the need to protect the whole nation the whole society but others like they have like their reasons to say yeah like uh, we don't trust the system especially if they have uh, such such arguments like the system is corrupt uh, or we don't have arms etc but still, Ukraine is the largest country in uh, the region with uh, over 40 million people before the, uh, before the full-scale invasion. Uh, how can it be possible that uh, the army cannot find uh, enough personnel to 
feel like uh, 50,000 or 100,000 of, um, of positions in the army. Well, one of the issues is uh, the uh, record keeping system. So uh, what happened was uh, that before the war, uh, most of the records were kept on paper and they were not uh, maintained very well. And so when the war started, uh, basically a lot of the people who are liable for the military service, they cannot be accounted for. They are not. So, for example, they are present in uh, the uh, tax services registers. Uh, they could be in some other registers, but uh, uh, the register that the military had set up uh, uh, some time ago, uh, they are not on that register. And so basically the army does not really know how many uh, people liable for the military service it has. And so this is another issue that uh, Ukraine is trying to address by a different law that was already adopted uh, and that actually puts into effect uh, the information exchange uh, between this register, which is called Oberich or Amulet, if you translate it into English, and uh, other re uh, government registers so that uh, the army can actually understand what uh, resources it has. Uh, so that's uh, uh, basically one of the issues, so to speak, like Ukraine's uh, institutional weakness uh, generally and uh, its uh, unpreparedness uh, for, for the war. But also there are some other issues. Uh, there was a public opinion poll in which uh, actually quite a number of uh, Ukrainian males liable for the military service said that they understand that uh, the, uh, the service is necessary, and I'm trying to look up the numbers. So uh, like 15.8% uh, are absolutely uh, ready to serve if they're called up, and 19% uh, are fairly prepared, uh, but... Uh, People uh, believe that uh, the mobilization needs to be fair, meaning that uh, it's n not certain uh, groups are targeted disproportionately, for example. Uh, and also another fear is uh, that uh, people are not provided with uh, sufficient training uh, when they're called up to serve, that they are not provided with uh, sufficient uh, uh, armaments and ammunition and sufficient gear and also there is a fear of ending up under a bad commander i mean we know that uh, ukrainian army unfortunately is a uh, hair of the soviet army and uh, it's still uh, struggling to overcome some of the legacies uh, of that and so uh, sometimes if you do end up under a bad commander it, this means that uh, your army service is going to be miserable that are, uh, of course, a number of reasons for people to uh, be scared of the service, even amid such a genocidal uh, war where, of course, uh, the nation needs to fight, otherwise it will be destroyed. We are talking to Yulia Kastavina, who is a visiting fellow at the Stockholm Center for Eastern European Studies, and she's a senior fellow at the Foreign Policy Council Ukrainian Prism. And don't forget to like, to share, to subscribe to this channel, and if you have your ideas uh, or questions or comments, write them under this uh, video. Um, you have already mentioned uh, this uh, unproportional uh, conscription pressure on different social groups. We have seen like some ideas uh, from the uh, from some politicians to uh, officially allow people to buy out of the service, to like to pay a special tax to not get drafted. Some found it a brilliant idea uh, how to f uh, fund the army. Others said that will just increase social gap between the poor and the rich and will increase uh, like the social tensions. But isn't it overall um, a situation in Ukraine that the politicians try to avoid this topic and don't go into details how they can conscript people? I would uh, divide this uh, question into uh, two separate issues. One is uh, the issue of communication from the Ukrainian officials, and the other one is the issue of balancing the military and the economic needs. And that's uh, uh, something that uh, you mentioned, the proposition to uh, let people who make uh, over a certain amount of money uh, not be drafted uh, to the army and uh, stay at home and, and pay taxes. Um, 
So uh, when we're talking about the Ukrainian officials, it's uh, absolutely true that uh, the issue is considered to be sensitive and uh, nobody really wants to take leadership uh, on it. Nobody really wants to take responsibility. And uh, uh, of course, uh, there was communication from uh, uh, the president at some point when they started. It was, I think, the first time they started really raising it. That was uh, in uh, uh, middle of uh, 2023 when these cases of uh, corruption came up and they started discussing them in uh, the uh, meetings of the uh, general general staff and uh, the president's uh, staff, uh, but they never really uh, talked about uh, mobilization being necessary and uh, tried to the, uh, the political leadership of the country tried to sort of make the military leadership responsible for it and. Uh, um, yeah, when uh, the draft law on mobilization was, was first sent uh, to the parliament, there were even media reports that uh, the president's uh, faction was told not to comment on it, not to discuss it publicly, and uh, so somehow uh, tried to uh, ha hide this issue because it's unpopular and because it may affect uh, president's uh, popularity. Uh, if, if I may interrupt you here, yes. what does... What does the Ukrainian law say here? What is the process? The army, like the, the general chief of staff, comes to the president and say, Mr. President, uh, I need 100,000 uh, new soldiers, um, and then the process starts. Or quite the opposite, the, the parliament says, wow, it's a good idea to increase the army because we don't see the results. We need, who needs to, who need, uh, to start the, uh, the whole process? Uh, well, actually, general mobilization uh, is already in place in Ukraine. Uh, immediately after the uh, full-scale invasion started, uh, President uh, adopted, made the decree, and that's uh, within his powers, so, and he announced uh, general mobilization in accordance to with, uh, with which the additional people have to be drafted into the army. And then the military comes up uh, with the number of the people uh, they need. And uh, then uh, the commissariats are supposed to uh, provide the number. But then commissariats, A, they need uh, records, uh, which they don't really have. And also they need a clear definition of uh, what uh, powers they have uh, with regards to those that uh, they're drafting, you know, like what, what, what's punishable, what's not, like uh, how do you get people to register, how do you... Basically, they, they need a, a functioning system. And so uh, this law on mobilization, it's not going to affect uh, like the number of people who, who are going to be drafted uh, because the, it's, it's only going to uh, make the uh, rules uh, more understandable and more transparent. So which people are uh, free from military service, which people... Uh, uh, can postpone their military service. Uh, it's, it's, the, the, and not, not only that, other things as well. But uh, basically, if we're talking about the pace of mobilization, that's uh, the work of uh, the military commissariats uh, that uh, is... And they can, uh, like they can name the numbers uh, and send them, like, we, we need, like, 100 people or 200 people. Or Number, do they numbers, become the numbers? Numbers come from the military, from the mobilization plan, and the numbers that we have heard, uh, which appear to be very big, like uh, 400,000, 500,000, those are not the numbers that uh, are needed uh, overnight, right? Those are like annual numbers of uh, the people that Ukrainian army may need. Uh, but uh, uh, we, <laughs> we didn't finish answering the previous question. Um, do you remember what it was? <laughs> Yeah, like uh, it was about the the process who starts to uh, who starts okay. the procedure and uh, mm -hmm. where where does this information go for the who takes decision who may say oh no I don't do it like can the parliament just block it or is it already set by the presidential decree so it functions by its own. The, par the parliament is not blocking. Uh, the parliament is working on this law and mobilization, which is going to uh, regulate uh, the process more clearly. Uh, but I remember that the, the question that we did not answer, that was about uh, the uh, economic part. And so, uh, I mean, if we um, look into the situation uh, 
Ukraine has Ukraine uh, receives a lot of uh, financial support uh, from its uh, partner countries, but uh, the financial support goes uh, mostly towards its uh, social and uh, uh, peacetime means. And Ukraine has to support its army on its own. And so, uh, for this reason, just like uh, any other country, you have to balance your military and uh, uh, your economic needs. And so, if you uh, draft all the uh, like able men into the army, then you have uh, huge gaps in in your economy, and you have huge gaps uh, because uh, then like who's going to produce the arms, who's going to uh, work, who's going to pay taxes to be able to uh, support the army, and uh, according to the calculation of the Ukrainian government, in order to support one uh, military uh, person at the front line, at least four people need to be working and. Uh, paying taxes. And so uh, there is no easy solution for this uh, problem, especially in Ukraine, where you have a huge income disparity. And uh, that income disparity is also visible between, for example, urban population, uh, like people in bigger city, big cities make a lot more money than people, for example, in uh, uh, villages. And so if uh, you adopt, for example, that uh, approach where uh, people who make over 35,000 hryvnia a month, uh, they're allowed not to uh, go to the front line and uh, stay in work, then uh, this uh, affects, uh, this clearly starts uh, affecting rural population disproportionately. And so there is no easy solution. Um, but actually on this issue, there was uh, some communication, there was a big article in uh, one of the le leading Ukrainian publications, Ukrainska Pravda, where they described uh, different uh, propositions and different ideas that are being discussed. And there was a communication from uh, Prime Minister, uh, Mr. Shmuihal. And from what I understand, there is no final decision, but uh, they're looking. And this is, uh, this is a very, uh, very difficult one. But uh, still, despite the need for new manpower, Ukraine doesn't conscript men under certain age. Like a huge number of young males uh, who are still not in their uh, like their age when they earn a lot of money. By the way, if, they, if that is the problem, no, the men between like eighteen and if I'm not mistaken, twenty seven until recently and now until twenty five, are not get conscripted. And the, um, the explanation is very uh, understandable. Ukraine doesn't want to sacrifice its youth. But is it like somehow strange to suffer problem with uh, lacking of manpower and do not tap on the social group of people who are traditionally been conscripted during any war? Uh, currently, uh, the uh, conscription age is 27 to 60, and uh, there was a law uh, voted on by the parliament uh, which brought down the lower uh, bar to 25 years. Uh, but uh, uh, last time I checked, which was uh, maybe a week ago or two weeks ago, president has not signed that law. And so it remains like this. But from, what I, from what I understand, it's not only not will, not being willing to sacrifice uh, these people. I mean, they can they can go and serve as volunteers. So they're if they want to, they can go and serve as volunteers. But it's also the issue of uh, demographics because in the 1990s, when Ukraine just became independent and uh, it was in a pretty dire uh, economic situation. So at that, uh, at that time, uh, not so many uh, people were born, so birth rates went down. And so uh, that share of the population, of the male population, is not that big. So uh, in, in a way, it's uh, trying to uh, also not just to sacrifice, not to preserve them, because there are not too many of them. But at the same time, our uh, discussion is on the table in Ukraine, and you addressed it in your uh, wonderful uh, study, which I recommend everyone to read, uh, that Ukraine can check the option of uh, conscripting women. Uh, at this point, uh, the, the discussion is not uh, cons uh, conscripting all women. But uh, only certain categories, people with uh, certain professions like medics, for example, and uh, those who can uh, uh, 
uh, do other uh, work, like for example, accounting work in the army, which also needs to be done, or some uh, management or bookkeep or keeping, like record keeping. So at this point, uh, uh, females, just like uh, like younger uh, people, they can volunteer for the army, uh, but uh, so far uh, there isn't. It's uh, actually one of the messages of the Russian propaganda that uh, Ukraine is going to uh, mobilize everybody. That is what I wanted to uh, ask you as my next question, but before I do, don't forget to like, to share, to subscribe to this channel and um, write your comments under this video. We're talking to Yulia Kazdovina, who is visiting fellow at the Stockholm Center for Eastern European Studies and a senior fellow at the Foreign Policy Council Ukrainian Prism. The Russian propaganda, as you mentioned, taps to this topic massively and uses this topic to demonstrate that Ukraine has allegedly lost the war, that the society is collapsing, which of course um, doesn't, uh, doesn't, uh, like is not true, like everyone who comes to Ukraine knows it's not true, but still like the videos circulate in inter on the internet, spread by trolls, like some people get arrested somewhere, Ukraine conscripts women, Ukraine does that and that. How much of this topic um, is being like a result of the Russian psychological warfare? It's uh, clear that Russia is uh, doing that and there is a number of uh, uh, Ukrainian fact-checking organizations and uh, media watchdog organizations that uh, uh, track uh, Russian propaganda and uh, they actually have come up with a large number of Russian narratives that uh, target Ukrainian uh, mobilization efforts. But at the same time, we uh, remember that uh, Russian propaganda very often uh, actually uh, th takes the existing problems and blows them up mm, out of proportion. And uh, so uh, it's true that uh, there are some cases when uh, the, um, the officers uh, of, uh, the, who, who are supposed to conduct mobilization that they actually mistreat uh, people or culture. So we, I mean, there, there, there are stories like this. This is not a systemic problem, but uh, uh, what Russian propaganda does, it just uh, takes cases like this and uh, spreads it and mentions it. And uh, because there is a thriving uh, sort of underworld of uh, uh, telegram messengers and uh, other uh, parts of the information space where it's uh, very easy uh, to spread this kind of uh, information. That uh, That is actually uh, becoming a problem and I think uh, this is a major failure of uh, uh, the Ukrainian officials uh, that they are, uh, they are not um, they underestimate the influence of uh, Russian propaganda efforts and uh, they actually do not have uh, a sort of like adult conversation with the society where they explain that actually, well, we do need to uh, mobilize and, uh, and this is what we understand that uh, there are some problems, but this is what we're doing to fix this, uh, these problems. Indeed, and uh, we know that sometimes this Russian propaganda is really successful. We know about a month ago, a group of locals has just like attacked a car in one of Western Ukrainian regions because they suddenly believe that in this car, some woman, the driver, uh, is attending to bring a conscription service to the town. It was absolutely weird. Like reminded reminded me the the first months of. Uh, of fears during the COVID pandemic mm -hmm. when people like were over anxious and uh, reacted weirdly. And that is of course very, uh, a very good area for Russia to spread uh, tensions and to ignite tensions within the Ukrainian society. But we also have a very uh, successful uh, cases uh, during the mobilization or uh, looking for volunteers for the army. You mentioned in your study the example of the uh, third storm assault brigade uh, which uh, is uh, quite a name and uh, launched a large scale advertising campaign um, uh, like offering people who think about conscription but are not sure where they land 
and the third assault uh, brigade they just uh, tell like look if you want to come to a good army unit just come to us and you will land in our in our service is it something special ukraine i don't know something like that from the bundeswehr or the u.s army it it is uh, it is uh, very very special. But uh, I would like to for a second to go back to the issue of the Russian propaganda. And uh, you actually mentioned uh, the early days of COVID, and uh, uh, there was a case in Ukraine. Uh, you probably remember it uh, when uh, there was a, a, a local uh, like uprising against. Uh, no, I mean, uprising is probably a good word, but uh, a loud word. But there was a uh, something the that actually turned into violence. Uh, when uh, people from China arrived and they were believed to, uh, and this was this was done uh, like uh, through through the uh, social media, and I think this is uh, something that uh, uh, Western uh, governments tend to underestimate is the power of uh, these messengers. You know, they they tend to rely on uh, only on the. Uh, sort of uh, kind of public instruments, right, only on communication and uh, explanation and free media and all that, uh, trying to counter Russian uh, propaganda. But cases like this, when people getting their information very often, uh, false information, very often emotionally uh, charged messages, which are not necessarily information, but just uh, uh, some sort of... Uh, made up stories, right, or uh, some stories that are made specifically to target uh, their fears and uh, their sort of uh, like human vulnerabilities, they get spread and this can be like, very localized and uh, uh, this is something that you cannot really uh, overcome uh, immediately with uh, all these measures of media literacy and uh, the measures that are being applied by uh, sort of like civilized countries believing that uh, somehow you can uh, fix it because this is a totally uh, new reality, totally new instruments that are, uh, they they can be like hyper-targeted, hyper-localized and uh, they, and so uh, I think that uh, Ukraine, uh, which in the early days of uh, the Russian aggression, I mean, in two th after 2014, right, uh, there were some decisions to block Russian social media, and uh, those were uh, rather uh, successful decisions from the point of view of limiting Russian propaganda, and Ukraine was uh, uh, criticized for that, for um, limiting uh, freedom of speech, but uh, I think that uh, cases like this uh, and uh, this uh, in this new reality, they demonstrate very clearly that this is not about uh, media freedom or freedom of speech. This is something that uh, can pose a national security threat. And so there has to be uh, more attention uh, to these issues given at, uh, at that level. And uh, there have to be powers with the security uh, services to actually find who's spreading that information and... Uh, also uh, punish them and uh, block uh, these channels because they undermine uh, national national uh, security. Uh, but uh, coming to uh, the third assault brigade, this really is a very interesting case uh, in Ukraine. Uh, this uh, uh, brigade is actually. Uh, seen as uh, one of the most successful and uh, the reasons uh, why that is is that they uh, a pay a lot of attention to the training of their conscripts b uh, they uh, take care of uh, the families of uh, the soldiers so if uh, somebody uh, is killed uh, for example in combat uh, they they know that uh, the family is uh, going to be uh, taken care of and they so basically they're like an exemplar sort of uh, the the way it should be and uh, also they have a very massive uh, online presence they have their own uh, like youtube channel where they uh, put footage of um, uh, the actual uh, combat they also have discussions uh, with uh, in which their commanders participate and they uh, emphasize uh, these values like humanity of uh, taking care of each other of uh, soldiers uh, like being brothers of the 
commanders actually being willing to listen uh, to the feedback from the soldiers and being open to uh, criticism and to suggestions and so uh, and actually uh, caring uh, about the lives of the soldiers and working to make sure they're equipped with everything and uh, people can uh, uh, they, they have a number of uh, their own recruitment centers um, uh, in uh, a number of Ukrainian big cities and people can come to them and uh, they can try themselves in a sort of a like near combat situation to see uh, whether or not uh, this is something they feel like they can be doing and uh, then they uh, go and they get a good training and uh, they go to the front lines and this approach has been a lot more successful than the approach uh, the government very often is trying to take when uh, uh, it's uh, let's say it like it's not perfect in terms of uh, uh, many of the things that are important and that uh, the third assault brigade emphasizes. Well, that is uh, indeed a good example, and I know that some of the other units they try to to copy that uh, experience and uh, these mechanisms, but of course uh, you cannot you cannot inspire people to come. Um, on a regular basis when uh, the news come that there are no ammunition shells, that uh, uh, it is not clear what is with the uh, Western support. And my government in Germany is extremely responsible for a negative way for what is going on on the front line as our Chancellor Scholz is still blocking Taurus missiles. Uh, do you think that this situation, always the lack of manpower for the Ukrainian army, it will somehow stabilize within the next months. What should be done for that? Uh, Ukraine is already doing uh, what needs to be done. I mean, uh, most likely it's not going to have an immediate effect, but uh, there is a clear awareness that uh, the training system needs to be uh, improved. <laughs> Uh, also clear awareness that uh, the mobilization system has to be improved and uh, uh, there is uh, uh, persecution of those uh, officials who were found guilty of corruption and of those who were found uh, guilty of uh, mistreating uh, the mobilized, uh, the, uh, um, the Bureau of, uh, of Investigations, Ukrainian Bureau of Investigations that started and launched a number of cases and sent a number of indictments to court and the Ministry of Defense continues uh, looking into and inspecting these services to make sure that they work properly. So uh, measures uh, are being taken. Uh, but since uh, the biggest issue, of course, is the institutional weakness and uh, the Soviet legacies in the Ukrainian army, uh, this is not going to be fixed really quickly. But uh, I'm sure that if uh, Western countries provide sufficient support, this is going to be an additional uh, argument for people to go fight. Because uh, when you understand that uh, you're going to the army and you have uh, uh, weapons, you have gear, you, you then uh, you are a lot more likely to actually uh, go. Indeed, and we all hope that uh, Ukraine will get as much weapons as it needs and that the Western governments will start to do what we must do to support Ukraine, not as long as it takes or as much as we can, but no, as much as Ukraine needs right now. Thank you so much for this uh, moving interview. It was Yulia Kazdovina. She's a visiting fellow at the Stockholm Center for Eastern European Studies and a senior fellow at the Foreign Policy Council Ukrainian Prism. Thank you for your interview, Yulia. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation. And don't forget to like, to share, to subscribe to this channel, leave your comments on this video and wait for the next starting interview.